Welcome to CPA Australia's webinar on the not-for-profit update for June 2021. My name is Courtney Love and I'm the Stakeholder Engagement Officer for Policy and Advocacy at CPA Australia. We have people joining us from all over the country today for today's webinar. And I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners from around Australia and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. It is my pleasure to start today by inviting Ram and Mel Yates to present. Ram is the Senior Manager for Reporting Policy for CPA Australia and Mel is the Director for Reporting, Red Tape Reduction and ACNC Corporate Services for the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. Before we start today, I'd just like to let you all know that we'll be taking questions through our Q&A box. Please direct all questions to all panellists if you do submit any. We will address questions at the conclusion and we will do our best with the time remaining. For any troubleshooting questions, queries, please send a message using the chat um, function to the host. It is now time for our session to commence, so I will hand over to Ram. Thank you, Courtney, and hello, everyone. Um, I'll jump straight into the presentation. Uh, many of you involved in uh, financial statement preparation or audit will have by now heard of the ASP project to remove the ability for entities to prepare special purpose financial statements particularly when they also state compliance uh, with the accounting standards developed and published by the ASP. Now, I will be using acronyms throughout this session. ASP, of course, stands for the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Uh, I'll use SPFS instead of special purpose financial statements, et cetera, just to cut short what I have to say uh, and keep it succinct. Um, so some of the changes are likely to come into effect. Uh, these changes that the ASP is working on are likely to come into effect a couple of years down the line uh, in the not-for-profit space, uh, whilst other changes are imminent uh, once again for the not-for-profit space. And I'll be talking about that later. Uh, most of my presentation today, I will be focusing on the impact of the ASP project on the not-for-profit sector, of course, uh, as most of you will be interested primarily in that topic. However, before I do that, uh, let me give you an update on the first phase of the ASP project, which has to do uh, with the um, uh, first phase of the project, which has to do with the for-profit sector. Uh, this project is now complete, so the preparers of financial statements and auditors involved in this space are looking at the impacts of the changes to their uh, practices. The removal of SPFS for the for-profit sector is effective for accounting periods commencing on or after 1st of July 2021, so imminent. So any for-profit entity that makes reference to the ASP accounting standards when preparing their financial statements will need to consider whether they can continue to prepare SPFS or, to pre or move to preparing general purpose financial statements or GPFS. Now, not all entities are currently preparing, uh, sorry, not all entities currently preparing SPFS will be affected, but this is a big change. So preparers and auditors will need to give some attention to the changes and consider if the changes will affect them, and if so, how. Now, the WSP project to do with uh, not-for-profits is not yet complete, uh, as I said earlier, but I will give you an update on the current status of this project. This update will give you some indications on the directions that could be taken, but this is still a work in progress uh, with many moving parts, many variables to it. So what uh, I have to say today uh, may not be the ultimate outcome. So please do keep that in mind. What you're getting really is a bit of a signposting uh, in terms of what's going to potentially happen. Now, I will not be talking about the ASP project as it relates to the public sector today, except to say that the ASP is currently undertaking some research and outreach activities at this stage before commencing the project in a substantial way. Now, we don't expect this project to kick off in a big way until the not-for-profit project is substantially completed. Let's quickly change slides. So, before we turn to the not-for-profit sector and the impact of the WSP project on this sector, uh, let's look at some types of entities that are going to be affected from 1st of July 2021 in the for-profit space. 
entities with legislative requirements will be affected, but entities with non-legislative requirements may also be affected uh, in terms of their prepar preparation of financial statements. Now, if you are interested in the for-profit sector, the ISB has recorded three webinars, uh, which goes into some detail on the changes to the for-profit sector. And I have provided uh, links below to these three webinars. Uh, these uh, slides will be available to participants after the presentation, so you can click through to the various links uh, that are embedded in my slides. But of course, you can always go to the ISB website and the three webinar recordings and the slides that go along with those recordings are freely available. So please do have a look if you are interested in the for-profit space, because I'm not going to dwell on the subject. All I have up there on this slide is some of the common types of entities that will be affected by the changes uh, made by the ASB from the 1st of July 2021. So these will be the entities that will no longer be able to prepare special purpose financial statements anymore. They must do GPFS from the 1st of July 2021. So that means for years ending 30th of June 2022 and onwards, uh, they will all have to do GPFS. Now I have highlighted there at the bottom of my slide there some for-profit entities with non-legislative requirements who can also be affected. So basically that's where you've got a constituting document or other document which makes a reference to the preparation of financial statements in accordance with Australian accounting standards. Now, not all entities with that reference will be affected. Uh, so if there are any changes to the constituting, constituting or other document post 1st of July 2021, or if a new document is created post 1st of July 2021, and there is a reference to financial statements to be prepared in accordance with Australian accounting standards, then those entities will be affected and they would have to prepare GPFS. Now, I have uh, uh, made a very brief reference to this. So it's it's a little bit more complex than what I've just explained uh, because that's not the focus of this session. So please do go to the ASB webinars uh, if you're interested in that topic further and uh, have a listen to what the ASB have said. Okay. Uh, now to the for profit sector potential changes that you will be uh, you've been eagerly awaiting for. Uh, let's look at some of the potential directions of the WSP in this space. And of course, I will also be talking about some of the changes which are not potential. They are they are already in place. Now, in this slide, I've given you a rough illustration of what happens currently in the not for profit space regarding financial reporting. Now, at the very top of this inverted pyramid, there are not-for-profits with no financial reporting requirements currently. This will include your small charities registered with the ACNC, uh, small companies limited by guarantee uh, under the Corporations Act uh, re regulated by ASIC, uh, no financial reporting requirements uh, currently, and that is expected to continue unless the leg legislation changes or the thresholds are changed, etc., uh, for such entities in the future. Um, so, and of course, there will be others like unincorporated associations and others who don't uh, come under any particular legislation uh, uh, who are not going to be affected by these changes. So the changes will be quite specific to entities which who are primarily going to be affected by legislative changes or in some cases by other changes. For example, if there's some grant agreement requirement for financial reporting there, you may have a change once again. We are sort of looking into the future a bit. Um, of course, the next uh, um, a piece of that pyramid is to do with uh, smaller not-for-profits, so your small charities, small companies limited by guarantee, etc. Um, um, sorry, I've already covered that. Um, talking about the smaller not-for-profits, which is um, 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 those that are currently required to do financial reporting, once again, uh, I'm not talking about small charities and small companies limited by guarantee here, but medium sized charities and medium sized companies limited by guarantee. As an example, uh, those currently have the uh, requirement to prepare financial reports uh, and they can do special purpose financial reports. Of course, larger charities and larger companies limited by guarantee also can do um, special purpose financial reports presently uh, if they are not a reporting entity. Now, 
Uh, just like in the for-profit sector, a vast majority of not-for-profits prepare for special purpose financial reports uh, or statements, depending on the legislation they come under. These can either be, as I said, small, medium, or large not-for-profits. Uh, charities, charities registered with the ACNC is one example. Um, and of course, right at the bottom of that pyramid, you've got um, some not-for-profits that do currently do general purpose financial statements. And I've given you some examples there of the type of entities that do general purpose financial statements currently, albeit it's a very small proportion of the overall um, uh, overall group that uh, you've got in the not-for-profit sector of around 700,000 not-for-profits. So what's the future going to look like? And this is somewhat crystal ball gazing uh, in terms of what it might look like. Uh, this slide gives you a rough idea of what the new not-for-profit financial reporting framework may look like when the WSB removes SPFS for not-for-profit entities in the near future. So at the top of this inverted pyramid, you have entities currently exempt from financial reporting, which I talked about in my previous slide, which will not be affected under the new proposals also, unless there is legislative change that I mentioned that brings them into some form of financial reporting. Of course, such entities may have to prepare financial reports for other reasons. As I said, for example, a grant provider may require financial reports as part of the conditions of providing the grant. Or you might have a requirement in your constituting document or something else. Um, of course, such not-for-profits may prepare financial statements as good practice, uh, which is also, of course, advisable. The WSB is currently considering a three or four tier model of financial reporting for not for profits, uh, which is slightly different to the for profit space where you only got two tiers of general purpose reporting. In the not for profit space, uh, you may have a slightly different model of financial reporting. Um, so, in the for profit space, we only have two tiers. Tier one is full compliance with all the Australian accounting standards, which are based on IFRS. And for tier two, it is broadly the same as tier one, except entities eligible to prepare tier two GPFS get some reductions in disclosures. Now, there is a new standard that deals with this simplified disclosures regime, uh, WSB 1060 or 1060, which I will be talking about a bit later, as it is also relevant to not for profits that currently prepare tier two GPFS under the RDR or the Reduced Disclosure Requirements Framework. At the very bottom of that inverted pyramid, there will be tier one GPFS uh, preparers, which is essentially applying all the accounting requirements of all the Australian accounting standards, uh, that is recognition, measurement, and disclosure requirements. There are very few not profits that do tier one GPFS, and there is no, such, no change at all for such entities. Tier one is not really mandated for, mandated for the not for profit sector in the large part, except in some very specific circumstances. Um, on top of this tier two simplified disclosures, um, uh, you've got uh, on top of this tier one uh, 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 framework, you've got this tier two simplified disclosures. This change will come in at the same time for not for profits as it does for for profit entities, that is, for periods beginning on or after 1st of July 2021. Um, and I will talk about this in a few slides' time in a little bit more detail. And on top of the tier two in this inverted pyramid is where we are now uh, entering somewhat uncharted territories in Australian standard setting. The WASP is proposing to introduce a new tier three reporting standard. This is likely to be a simplified accruals based standard that has a number of simplifications to the accounting requirements found in full Australian accounting standards. The WASP is actually meeting next week and they have a paper that gives some indication as to what could be included in such a standard for tier three. And if you're really interested, uh, please do go to the WSP website and have a look if you are interested. Uh, this is still early days, I must say. So all you have at this stage is staff views, which they have developed on what kinds of things could be included in the tier three standard. And this, this is based on outreach they have conducted with the sector so far. Uh, CP Australia has been part of this outreach as well and has provided input to this exercise. Uh, we expect that the board, this is the WSB board, will debate these proposals with a view to putting out a uh, public consultation later this year. Uh, New Zealand currently has a similar simplified accrual standard for charities that the WSB is considering 
uh, and looking at as part of the proposals it is developing. Now, the WSP is also considering a potential tier four cash based accounting standard, although no concrete proposals have been developed at this stage for a tier four cash based standard. The jury is still out on whether we will get a tier four very simple cash based standard or alternatively this large group of not -for profits may potentially continue to do what they do now. So they may do SPFS, um, which uh, is currently what they do. Now, um, on this slide, you'll see that I've identified the simplified accruals based standard for medium not for profits and the cash based standard for small not for profits. Now, that's not necessarily how this is going to land because the WSB is not currently intending to set the thresholds for who can apply the proposed new tier three standard. The reason for this is that the WSP will have to rely on not-for-profit laws and regulations. And of course, there are plenty of those around the country to determine who can do tier three simplified accruals financial reports or a tier four cash-based financial report if that eventuates. Uh, WSP itself may not have the ability to set the thresholds for when these lower reporting requirements kick in. And why this might, why is this, you might ask. And as I said, it is to do with the various different legislative reporting requirements that we have in, Aust in Australia for not-for-profit financial reporting at both the Commonwealth and the state and territory levels. I mean, even if you look at the Commonwealth level, you've got the uh, Office for the Register of Indigenous Corporations, which has certain thresholds for reporting under the ORIC requirements. ACNC has its own requirements. Uh, the um, Corporations Act has requirements for companies limited by guarantee, albeit that's aligned with the a ACNC requirements. So, uh, of course, at the state territory level, you've got a broader range of diversity uh, in, in the legislated requirements for financial reporting. Now, there is some alignment in these requirements, particularly since the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission was established back in 2012. But there are quite a few differences as well, but the ACNC has taken leadership in this space and is working through and trying to reduce uh, the inconsistencies across the financial reporting requirements in different uh, uh, regulatory regimes. So as an example, the reporting requirements in New South Wales, so this is at the state level uh, for incorporated associations in New South Wales is not the same as the reporting requirements for incorporated associations in Queensland. Once again, that differs from incorporated associations in Victoria. So you've got all these different thresholds in play. And how do we apply a multi-tiered reporting framework when the thresholds are different? So that's the challenge that we as a not-for-profit uh, sector in Australia have to deal with. Uh, and I, when I say that, I mean, it includes the regulators, the lawmakers, the professional associations such as CP Australia, and of course, the not-for-profit sector itself. The WSB can develop and publish simplified reporting requirements for not-for-profits, but it will ultimately up, be up to the legislators and regulators to incorpor incorporate these simpler reporting requirements into their respective laws and regulations and pass on the benefits to the entities that prepare financial reports. Whilst developing the standards, the WSB is also simultaneously engaging in consultations with Commonwealth and state territory regulators presently to get them on board so that there can be widespread adoption of the not profit new not profit framework which is being developed just so you're aware there's currently an open proposal to raise financial reporting thresholds for charities registered with the ACNC which is currently being considered by government and Mel will be talking about these proposed threshold changes as part of his presentation Very quickly, a couple other things to keep in mind for the upcoming changes to the not-for-profit sectors. Uh, one of those changes is to do with uh, WSB 2019-4, which is an amending standard, um, which amended WSB 1054. That's already in place. So that came in force for the years ending 30th of June 2020 and onwards. Um, and my next slide, I'll just touch on that. But I also wanted to mention the, um, the project that the WSB had to redefine or, or bring in a, a, a new or updated definition of the term not for profit. Now, what you've got there within the cross space is the previously proposed definition of not for profit, uh, but the WSP has decided that they will not proceed with that uh, updated definition. 
So we are now going to be sticking with the old definition or the current definition as it stands, which I've also got up there on the slide. So that will be the definition going forward uh, as the WASB has decided to not continue with its project to update the definition which it previously had been considering doing. So here we are looking at the disclosure requirements um, that uh, came in through WSV 2019-4 from uh, 30th of June 2020 onwards. Whilst the WSV is working on the replacement framework for the current model, they made a couple of important changes to disclosures made by some not-for-profits that prepares SPFS. This change is already in place, as I've said, so you would have already considered it in the previous year, and of course you will need to consider it for June 2021 also. Um, but keep in mind, these disclosures do not affect all NFPs, but only some that specifically have a legislative requirement to apply WSP 1054. This will include charities registered with the ACNC and companies limited by guarantee under the Corporations Act. Other than these two common types of NFPs, please have a look at the legislation that affects your not-for-profit to see if WSP 1054 is mandated in determining whether these disclosures affect you. And I'm not going to go through the disclosures themselves as they are listed here. And of course, you can always have a look at WSB 1054 to get more detail around the disclosures. Now, as part of my presentation, I'm using some slides used by the WSB in the webinar I mentioned earlier, where they provided an overview of the changes affecting for-profit entities. I would like to thank and acknowledge the WSB at this stage for giving me permission to use these slides as part of this presentation. Earlier, I mentioned that the changes have been implemented by the WSB will affect not profits also but that currently do tier two RDR financial statements. So we will look at that a little bit more in a little bit more detail over the next few slides. So the current GPF, GPFS framework has two tiers and will be relevant to not-for-profit entities that prepare financial statements under either tier. For tier one, there is no change. So any not-for-profit entity that currently prepares tier one financial statements will continue to do so. Um, there is a change, however, for tier two preparers of not-for-profit financial statements from the 1st of July, 2021. Tier two now is replaced by tier two simplified disclosures contained in one standard. WSB 1060. The WSB has changed the format and to some extent the content of the tier two framework. I'm not once again going into the details of this tier two framework, um, uh, but uh, you can always have a look at WSB 1060 to see what the changes are there. And of course, if you look at the webinar that I mentioned, uh, the uh, WSB webinars that I mentioned, particularly the second one, I think, if you have a look at the second webinar that goes into some detail on what changes have been brought in by ASB 1060 for tier two preparers. So have a look at that webinar. So um, impact on entities transitioning on uh, uh, 1st of July 2021 on, uh, on onwards. On this slide, I've put up some of the changes that um, you have to keep in mind if you're an RDR preparer, a tier two RDR preparer now. And um, so you will be moving to a tier two uh, simplified disclosures framework based on AASB 1060. You do have a choice for preparing an opening balance sheet using either the AASB 108 approach or the um, uh, Or the WSB1 approach. Uh, you do have to restate all comparatives. So if you're doing your first set of uh, GPFS uh, under tier two WSB 1060 uh, for 30th of June 2022, you will have to restate your 30th of June 2021 year period as well. Um, although there is no requirement to distinguish errors from changes in accounting policies, that's one uh, uh, exemption, if you wish, or relief, if you wish, that the WSB is granted as part of this change. If you are early adopting um, uh, to 30th of June 2021, for example, you don't have to restate your comparatives. What I mean by that is you keep your comparatives as you currently prepared them for the 30th of June 2020 period. So you don't need to restate your comparatives, which may be an important thing for some people. Um, but uh, keep in mind that if you do, uh, you, you do choose not to early adopt, 
uh, and uh, you prepare for say the 30th of June 2022 period, then you do have to restate your comparatives as tier two GPA phase under the new framework. Um, one reminder, however, there are no exemptions in terms of recognition, measurement, and presentation. The only uh, simplification is in terms of disclosure. Uh, but of course, as a tier two RDR preparer currently, you already know that, and you are already going. You 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 already are doing full recognition, measurement, and present presentation as well. So I don't need to teach, teach uh, preach to the converted if you wish. Um, just moving on to uh, a few other matters that I want to quickly cover before I um, pass over to Mel. Um, and as I said, I previously mentioned that Mel will cover the impending changes to the ACNC financial reporting thresholds uh, as part of his presentation. So I will not dwell on that point here. So quickly touching on leases, double ASB 16, where are we with leases? Well, it still tends to be challenging uh, in terms of, of the various aspects of uh, lease accounting in the not-for-profit space, especially when you've got to uh, present value your right of use asset and your lease liability, um, especially when you have to establish what your discount rate is or your uh, effective interest rate is for that calculation. Um, so there are some challenges that we're hearing still but broadly speaking, most people have just gotten on with their jobs and uh, 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 incorporated the requirements of WSB 16 uh, into their financial statements where it uh, where it applies. Um, revenue or income recognition, so that's your WSB 15 and WSB 1058. We are still getting some challenges coming through on that. Um, when WSB 1058 was developed as a replacement for WSB 1004, the old standard which directed uh, people on how to account for income other than revenue, um, people felt that there was more clarity around how to account for uh, income like grants and donations under WSB 1058. But some quirks have arisen since when people have started applying this standard in practice particularly where certain grant agreements are not very clear on um, uh, conditions. So you're really looking for things like, are there um, specific, sufficiently specific activities? And is there enforceability in the contract? Um, sometimes grant agreements are not very clear on these very, very, quite very specific terms that are required for uh, uh, the deferral of income. Um, so in those cases, you really have to end up recognizing all your income uh, as and when you receive it. And that is providing some challenges to um, preparers uh, when applying WSB 1058. Uh, we're hearing that particularly in the uh, research grants area where you receive, re receive research grants. There are some challenges arising in that space, in the not-for-profit space. But I won't go into the detail once again. This is supposed to be a short update. So I won't go into the detail at all. I'm just going to quickly highlight some resources, which are fact sheets that we've developed. Um, I might have mentioned this in a previous presentation as well. So please do have a look at these fact sheets for the uh, WSB project to remove SPFS. And we also have a specific fact sheet look, that looks at the changes for not-for-profit entities. And I thank you for that, uh, for listening to my presentation, and I will now pass over to uh, Mal Yates for his presentation. Over to you, Mal. Thank you, Ram. Good, um, good day to everyone who is participating in today's webinar. My name is Mel Yates, and I'll be providing the ACNC part of today's presentation. So I just want to start off really by setting a little bit of context about the charity register and the increase in the searches that are being done of the charity register, which is obviously publicly available information. It's free to use and it includes information about charities and obviously of interest to us here today is the financial information, including the financial statements for those organisations that either provide them voluntarily to the ACNC or are required to provide those financial statements as part of the ACNC legislative framework. So this graph here is just showing the increase in the searches that 
people, stakeholders, donors, volunteers, funders, stakeholders right across the community are looking for information about registered charities in more regularity and in increased numbers. Now, the reason that I'm just flagging this with everyone today is obviously you have a role to play either as a financial statement preparer or as an assurance provider. So with this information that is available uh, through the ACNC register, this is basically putting your work on show and it's a reflection of the charitable organisation that you either work for or you work with. So uh, really that just sort of sets the context that there is interest in information about charities and there is a lot of uh, attention that we are seeing on the charity register and the information that is available. Now, moving forward, what we're planning to do, and this will be happening during the 2021 calendar year, we're actually planning on making a number of changes to the search functionality that is on the ACNC register. Now, the way we will be doing this, it builds on the changes that we made in 2020, where we actually launched questions about charity programs. We used to ask charities information about their activities. We replaced that in 2020 with questions about programs. What uh, program or programs a charity provides to beneficiaries, and that's using a classification that is a taxonomy of different um, different um, uh, definitions, if you like, of what a charity can do. We also ask information about the beneficiaries that those programs are supporting, as well as the locations that those programs are being provided. And that can include online, it can include physical, or it can include a geographical area as well. So there's a lot more flexibility that we launched in 2020, and we want to build on that in 2021. So after charities start lodging their 2021 annual information statement, that is the point uh, of in time that we will launch that additional functionality, which will really enhance the ability for people to use the charity register and find information about charities and programs in a particular geographic location that they may be interested in finding out about. And what we're seeing through the work that we've been doing in developing this is there is real interest from charities uh, and from stakeholders that obviously are interested in the information about registered charities. So moving forward, there has obviously been some progress in relation to the ACNC Legislative Review, which became public in March of 2020. Now, obviously, a lot has happened over the last year and a little bit since that date and that information was released. But I just wanted to touch on a couple of the recommendations that have recently been consulted on. So one of them is recommendation 20, and that's in relation to governance standards that charities are required to comply with, except where there is an exemption, such as basic religious charities. Now, Treasury did some consultation on some proposed changes to governance standard three, and that happened in March of this year. And that really would expand the scope of impermissible activities that registered charities must not engage in or promote others to engage in. So there's more consideration being done by government in relation to this. You may or may not have seen some of these uh, being reported in the media. And that is really with government to consider the feedback that was received as part of that consultation process. And we expect to hear more clarity in relation to a way forward in due course. But the second thing I want to touch on, and Ram alluded to this in his part of the presentation today, is really the financial reporting thresholds. Now, the size of a charity reporting to the ACNC is determined by the thresholds that apply. Revenue is 
the way that a size is determined. So the large, medium and small tiers are all based on revenue. And that is using the ordinary concept of revenue for each financial period. What was consulted on in March of this year was an increase to the financial reporting thresholds. So currently there are three tiers. Those three separate tiers would remain under the proposals that were consulted on, but the thresholds for which a medium charity and a large charity are determined would be increased quite a lot. So a small entity would be any entity up to $500,000 in revenue. So at the $500,000 point, that would become a medium charity. And then the medium sized would, uh, the medium sized threshold would apply up to $3 million in revenue. And once an organization hit that $3 million mark in revenue, then it would become a large charity for the purposes of the ACNC reporting framework. So it's, it's a doubling of the small threshold and a tripling of the large threshold. So there would be much greater uh, scope for organizations to potentially reduce their reporting obligations, depending on where they currently sit in the size tiers. And again, we are waiting for government to make an announcement on this, but when this was consulted on in March, there was a commitment made that an outcome of the consultation would be announced before the 30th of June, 2021. Now, where are we today? It's the 15th of June. So there's not a lot of time for that announcement to be made. So it's a watch this space until we get more clarity as to whether this will be implemented. Now, one of the massive advantages of this consultation would be that the ACNC thresholds would increase but also all of the states and territories were involved in this consultation and it would also apply to other reporting obligations that those state and territory regulators apply to organisations that need to report to them. So predominantly it would impact incorporated associations and there would be freedom for each state and territory to decide what they want to do under this new uh, under these new harmonized reporting thresholds but the advantage would be that this is an opportunity to get some consistent thresholds right across all of the states and territories as well as the commonwealth for the first time in relation to uh, registered charities and potentially other not-for-profit entities um, that obviously have obligations to respective state and territory regulators now, in terms of the assurance provide uh, the insur the assurance requirements for each of these tiers, the proposal, as uh, Ram sort of highlighted in his earlier part of the presentation, they would remain. So, small organisations would need to provide an annual information statement. Medium-sized charities would need to provide the annual information statement plus financial statements that had been reviewed as a minimum. And then once we hit the large size, those organisations would need to prepare an annual information statement as well as audited financial statements. So we're watching this space. Now I do wanna to touch on some best practice disclosure guidance, which the ACNC released very late last year, very early this calendar year, which we're encouraging charities to consider and adopt. So these best practice disclosures were developed really because government revenue makes up the lion's share of revenue for the sector. So based on the latest information we have, it's just about half of revenue in the sector comes from all levels of government. And there's a lot of interest in the sources of revenue that go to, to charities. And so that's why we've developed these financial disclosures around government revenue. For some organisations, they are already making these disclosures. And these best practice, um, these best practice um, uh, sort of guidance is not intended to replace 
it's intended to provide some direction and clarity for organisations that don't necessarily have to provide this information specifically to give them some uh, building blocks, if you like, so that they can adopt better practice disclosures around government revenue to enable more consistency and comparability of this information across the broader charity sector. So there are three main aspects to this. What we have said in the best practice guidance is that where a charity receives at least 10% or more of its total revenue from government, we would like the organisation to disclose information about the sources of government revenue. And I'll provide the example here on the screen. This is a, an example note. To provide up to the top 10 largest sources of government revenue, including the source, so that is the agency or the department name, and the amount. So it, does, it doesn't necessarily mean that an organisation will report all of its government revenue, but certainly the 10 biggest sources of government revenue should give a real indication of the, uh, the sources that are providing support to that particular charitable organisation. Now, in addition to that, we have asked for charities to think about where they have any economic dependency um, in relation to government revenue. So this is something really that each organisation could be should be considering within its own context as to whether there is a reliance on government revenue. And what we're also saying is to um, include information about any revenue which has been received from government but has not yet been recognised as revenue because the performance obligations haven't necessarily been met. Now, particularly for organisations that prepare special purpose financial statements, and therefore the disclosure requirements in AASB 15 and 1058 may not necessarily apply. That's why we've included this information uh, to help support those organisations provide that little bit of extra information about monies which are being held as a liability. And this also extends, I should point out the last point on that slide, this also extends to instances where an organisation receives revenue from a government agency, but which it may be employed by a service user or a beneficiary. So the classic example of this is the National Disability Insurance Scheme, where a service user receives funding from government for their own particular needs. And that service user may request the services from a charitable organisation to provide those services to them. So please do have a look on the uh, website. We've got the information there, the website uh, location of the best practice disclosures. I encourage all charities to have a look at that and think about what they can do to improve transparency in relation to their reporting. Now, I do wanna spend a couple of minutes just talking about some of the issues that we do find in the reporting of registered charities to the ACNC. So we have a program of work which is undertaken each year. And really what we try to do is look at a sample of financial reports from charities to help us understand the level of compliance and to identify any issues that we think would help um, uh, would, would be helped by the development of guidance or, or tools or resources to help improve reporting by charities. So one of the biggest things that we look at is making sure that the annual information statement reflects the annual financial report in terms of the profit and loss and the balance sheet items which need to be included in the annual information statement. So making sure that there's consistency. There may be instances where there is not consistency and that's perfectly okay because the ACNC does accept consolidated financial statements. But in the annual information statement, we only want the relevant information about registered charities. So there will be instances where there is a mismatch, but we do ask that in the financial report, organisations should include a reconciliation where there is a difference. 
Now, moving over to the annual financial report, we do find that there are a lot of organisations which don't include a complete set of financial statements. So for the ACNC Act purposes, we expect that to be the legislative framework that charities are preparing or the basis of preparation. We expect to see the four statements, the statement of financial position, financial performance, cash flow and changes in equity. We also require the notes that accompany the financial statements, as well as the declaration from responsible persons in relation to the financial statements. And obviously, where a charity has to have some sort of assurance, be that a review or an audit, we expect the review or the audit report to be included and attached with the financial statements. But surprisingly, in many cases, we don't see the full set of financial statements or something is missing. So we have developed an AFR checklist just to make sure that charities have something to use to, to ensure that they are including everything that should be included when that AFR is submitted to the ACNC. Now, we do get a lot of questions about the minimum accounting standards which do apply. Now, obviously, if an organisation is preparing general purpose financial statements, then all relevant accounting standards would apply. If a charity prepares special purpose financial statements, there are five minimum standards, and they are 101, 107, 108, 1048 and 1054. In addition to any revenue standards which apply, and that is the way that size is determined. So really, uh, currently 15 and 1058, they do apply to organisations which are preparing special purpose financial statements because that is the mechanism by which a charity determines its size and therefore reporting obligations. Now, we do have transitional reporting arrangements. We're getting into the period in 2021, once we've launched the annual information statement for 2021, many of these transitional reporting arrangements will have expired. So we put in place transitional reporting arrangements whereby we enter into a streamlined reporting arrangement and switch off duplicated reporting to one of the different states or territories around Australia. Now, because each of the jurisdictions has different reporting requirements, we provide a phased in approach for charities to make sure that they are doing everything that is required under the ACNC reporting framework, an incremental approach, if you like, to allow organisations to progressively adopt our reporting framework. And finally, I do want to touch on related party disclosures. So where an organisation is preparing general purpose financial statements, we expect to see related party disclosures under 124. So that is something that we do see uh, a lot of non-compliance with. And so that continues to be a focus area. And many of you would be aware that under the legislative review, this was one of the recommendations that was supported by government. So going forward, we expect to get um, some sort of clarity from government about when related party transactions are likely to be a requirement for all organisations, not just those that prepare general purpose financial statements. So I commend you to have a look at the information that is in relation to financial reporting and the minimum requirements, which uh, was the link on the last slide. I very briefly would like to touch on some of the group reporting conditions. Why am I doing this? Because we do have the option under the ACNC framework for multiple registered charities to provide one annual information statement on behalf of all of those separate entities and therefore consolidated financial statements as well. Now, in order to report as a group, you do need to apply to the ACNC. We consider those applications and we impose conditions on the approval to report as a group. Now, basically, the reason that we do this is to make sure that uh, there is, I guess, uh, a consistent level of accountability and transparency for those organisations that get that benefit 
for providing one set of accounting and one set of reporting to the ACNC. So there are five different conditions there. I won't go through those in, in a lot of detail, but what I really want to underline is the importance of any grouped reporters making sure they are aware of those conditions and making sure that they are complying with them because complying with the group conditions is an ongoing requirement to be able to report as a group. So that was really all I wanted to focus on today. I have included in the slides some links and resources which may be relevant to many of you just to provide a little bit of additional information. And there are all of our contact details should you wish to get in touch with the ACNC. I would point out that uh, the best way to contact the ACNC is using the online contact form. That's the third box down from the top, acnc.gov.au forward slash contact us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mel, for that update. A uh, very uh, useful update with lots of uh, information in there. Uh, of course, uh, I think both our presentations, uh, we covered a lot of ground in the not-for-profit space within a very short period of time. So the the level of detail we can go into, into particularly in my presentation in some of these areas, is somewhat limited. So if you do have any questions, this is a very good time for you to pose them. Uh, Mel and I are both available to answer your questions for the next five or so minutes. So please do ask any questions that you have. In the meantime, there's definitely one question that's already been asked, uh, Mel, and maybe I'll ask you that particular question. And this is to do with the uh, income, uh, the uh, garment income point that you mentioned, the sources of garment income. And the questions around the origin of the funding, even when a charity receives funding from an intermediary. So if the state government grants local councils with funds to provide grants onwards, the charity receives the funds direct from the local government. Uh, is the source considered local rather than state government? That's the question. So that's a good question. And thanks so much, Anne-Marie, for that question. Um, there will be instances where a charity will know the source of revenue, and there will be instances where a charity won't necessarily have visibility. So if a local council is giving out grants, uh, even though the state government has provided those, those funds, uh, it would be sufficient to include that revenue as revenue from a local council, because ultimately the local council has distributed um, that grant and there is a, or there would be, I would expect, I can't say for sure, but I would expect there would be some sort of process that the state government, uh, sorry, the local council would go through in order to assess which grants they want to support. So there would be some sort of discretion about whether they support one particular grant application or another. So in that instance, I think it would be fine to include that revenue as revenue from local government or councils, depending on the state or the territory um, where that charity is operating. Sometimes different terms are used. Thank you for that, Mel. Uh, there was another question on ACNC reporting thresholds, but that participant has actually identified the answer themselves and posted it online. But just for completeness sake, the other participants, participants would be interested in this as well. The original question was to do with the original proposed increase in thresholds of uh, 1 million for uh, medium charities and 5 million for larger charities. And then, of course, when you presented, you mentioned the thresholds going up to half a million and three million. Perhaps for the um, benefit of all participants, could you just explain why there's a difference between the two? Absolutely. And thanks, thanks, Ellie, for the question. Very observant. So when the legislative review was conducted, the expert panel um, originally had two sort of scenarios that they suggested could apply for an increase in the thresholds. So that was finalised and then government had a look at those recommendations and they said that they supported an increase in the thresholds, but they wanted to consult further 
with the states and the territories to try and ensure that there was some element of consistency when the thresholds were increased. So the outcome of the consultation, which was those thresholds that I referred to of 500,000 and 3 million, that was actually based on the consultation that the Commonwealth Treasury did with all of the states and territories. And they were the thresholds that were uh, ag agreed on by all parties to consult on. So I can't necessarily answer why there was the change, but hopefully that gives you enough context to understand that even though the initial recommendation had the higher numbers, when the Treasury consulted with the states and territories, there was agreement on those thresholds that were consulted on, and that was 500,000 and 3 million for the large, um, for the large uh, threshold. Thank you for that, Mel. Thanks for uh, providing that additional uh, information. Um, I've just had another um, question come through. Um, we work with an independent school. We are registered with the ACNC. Uh, we also have a couple of DGR uh, building and scholarship funds associated with the school. A uh, colleague has mentioned that the funds will need to be separately registered with the ACNC in the future. I do not read the legislation the same way as my colleague. Do you think you can throw some light on that question? Yeah, so I won't, I won't necessarily. Thanks, Jennifer, for the question. Non-government schools, um, there is some anomalies with, with non-government schools, but the government have been consulting on a range of reforms that specifically relate to deductible gift recipient entities. So what I would suggest, and I'm not sure if you have or haven't, but there is a lot of information on the ACNC website about the need or not to register as a charity if you are a DGR entity. So I won't necessarily answer that question definitively because it really depends on the particular circumstances of the independent school as well as some other factors. So have a look at the information on the ACNC website. If you wanted to speak to the ACNC further, I would suggest that you contact the ACNC directly. Excellent. Thank you for that, Mel. I'm conscious that we're very close to one o'clock. Um, before I uh, pass back to Courtney, I just wanted to mention uh, in respect of the um, of the annual information statement and annual financial report review that you conduct annually. Um, I have recorded a podcast with you, Mel, of course, uh, which uh, we are currently getting finalised. So hopefully we will get that published either in uh, late June or early July. So that will be put out in CPA update once uh, that's been finalised. And that specifically focuses on the annual uh, uh, review program that the ACNC has. So please do have a listen if you're interested in that particular topic that uh, Mel spoke about in one of his slides. So um, Mel, did you have anything else to add at this stage? Nothing from me. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mel, for your presentation. Uh, and I will now pass back to Courtney. Thank you, Ram, and thank you, Mel, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And to anybody that asks any questions, I'll now pass back to Melissa, our host, to close up the session. Thank you, Courtney, Ram, and Mel, and thank you to everyone for your participation today. In the next three working days, you'll receive an evaluation survey accompanied by a recording of this webinar. We really appreciate your feedback as it is extremely valuable to CPA Australia to help us deliver better events for you. Thanks again, and we look forward to welcoming you to another CPA Australia webinar soon.